confident. Got a little loosey goosey. What an uppercut by Douglas. And down goes Tyson. Let's go ahead and call it the biggest upset in the history of heavyweight championship fights. Say it now, gentlemen. James Buster Douglas, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. the Japanese program for the Mike Tyson Buster Douglas fight and right here in Japanese it says Rocky lives his real name is James Buster Douglas fairy tales do come true the prince who slays the dragon is James Buster Douglas hi I'm Larry Merchant still willing to bet that Tyson will beat Douglas last week still amazed by the drama of an underdog turning an electric chair into a throne no longer amazed by the brazen attempt to steal or void the victory. Truth and justice did prevail, which sometimes in boxing is an upset. Boxing is the sky above and mud below of games, able to reach transcendent highs of skill, courage, and emotion, or plunge to larcenous lows of double dealing. We had it all, and we'll show it all to you. And then Mike Tyson and Buster Douglas will meet here for the first time to discuss the fight, the controversy, and their futures. We'll show you some surprising footage of the controversial knockdowns, abetted by other revealing knockouts, that suggest that the maligned referee did not, after all, make a mistake. And finally, two of the most respected men in boxing, Angelo Dundee and Gil Clancy, will analyze the fight, the much criticized role of Tyson's cornermen, and they'll speculate on the rematch. Now to February 11th in Japan, which was February 10th in America, and heaven for fight fans. And we are live inside Korakuen Stadium in Tokyo, Japan, as HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. Undisputed heavyweight champion Mike Tyson's 10th title defense against the challenger James Buster Douglas. It is scheduled for 12 rounds. And a look around inside this soft ceiling, air suspended dome, not unlike the Carrier Dome in Syracuse or the Silver Dome in Pontiac, Michigan. In this configuration for boxing, it will seat 63,000 people. There's some debate as to how many tickets have actually been sold, but as you can see, there are many empty seats by no means a sellout attendance may be as low as 30,000 or less but in ultra prosperous Tokyo all of the ringside seats at a thousand dollars a piece have long been sold and hello again I'm Jim Lampley we at HBO welcome you and the world of big-time boxing back to Japan to test the theory that ticket buyers on foreign shores will purchase what Americans seem increasingly unwilling to shell out for apparent mismatches for Mike Tyson in defense of his heavyweight crown. With me again now is our HBO boxing expert, ring legend Sugar Ray Leonard. And Ray, we assume that it becomes increasingly difficult for Mike Tyson to prepare for boxing matches that most of us see as non-competitive. You spent a couple of hours with the champion two days ago. What was his mood? I tell you, Jim, it was a very interesting setting because traditionally Mike would have a number of people around him. But this particular time, this particular fight, rather, he's had about a handful of people there. And the reason being, I think Mike Tyson's aware that he's always on the microscope. His performances, whether they go one round, two rounds, they're highly criticized. So he needs to be by himself in a much more subdued and relaxed atmosphere. And that's what he has now. And, of course, the man we like to have with us when we get ready to call one of these championship fights, HBO boxing analyst, the well-versed Larry Merchant. Larry, what are we about to see? Another 90-second annihilation of an ill-prepared opponent? Well, in the important game of expectations, this fight is over before it begins or soon thereafter. You have to remember that uh, just nobody believes anybody can compete with Mike Tyson. In fact, 
Ed Schuyler of the Associated Press, when he arrived in Tokyo, was asked by a customs official what he was doing here. He said he was here to cover the Tyson-Douglas fight. How long do you expect to work? The customs official asked. Oh, he said, about 90 seconds. The good news is that Douglas has fought his best fighters against the best fighters he's fought, so perhaps we'll get a few rounds. Uh, also, Jim, uh, Douglas has a dog, a beagle named Shakespeare, and I believe that any prize fighter with a dog named Shakespeare can't be all bad. Buster Douglas tells us that his favorite Shakespearean play is the romantic tragedy Romeo and Juliet. Now we strain for a look at 29-year-old Buster Douglas as he emerges from his dressing room where we are told he has spent most of the last hour resting quietly. His last fight, a 10-round decision over Oliver McCall, was on the undercard of Tyson's 93-second conquest of Carl the Truth Williams in Atlantic City. You see his rankings, number two for the IBF, number three for the WBC, and number four for the WBA. As a footnote, the number one-ranked heavyweight contender in all three governing bodies' estimation is Evander Holyfield, who is here at ringside, and we expect to be talking live with him at the end of the bout. This is more animated than we usually see Buster Douglas, so he is obviously excited. But despite all of the woes that you outlined, Jim, he now has to go out and fight the most fearsome fighter on the planet. He will, however, go away with about a million dollars. And uh, that should cap his professional career quite nicely. If he gives a good performance, even if he doesn't win, he would be in line for more money. So he has a lot of motivation. 34 official fights. He did fight one bout, which was ruled a no contest. 19 knockouts among his 29 and victories. And his uh, two best victories were over uh, fractional champions, uh, champions for a few days, Greg Page and Trevor Burbick. A look at that weight progression. In his sixth pro fight back in 1981, he weighed 208. Two years later, he weighed 260. He was over 240 last July when he fought Oliver McCall. He enters here at 230 pounds, which would suggest that Buster's in for Good shape. Well, I always mention to Buster Douglas that he, he doesn't have the discipline. He told me this is the new Buster Douglas. And here is a familiar Mike Tyson rushing toward the ring, wanting to, to get it on and get it over with. Flanked by the entourage, which, as Ray Leonard pointed out, is dwindling in size from fight to fight. Mike has turned this phase of a fight, his favorite phase. He calls it like going out on a date. It's finally going to happen. Of course, his idea of a date is wham, bam, thank you, sir. <laughs> The man closer to Tyson, or to the screen, just inside of Tyson, on screen right there, is Jay Bright, one of the two listed co-trainers. Not in sight in this picture is Aaron Snowell, the other co-trainer. They, of course, the men who inherited the role of training Tyson when Kevin Rooney was expelled from the Tyson camp. 37 wins, 33 knockouts, only one decision in a title fight, and that was the 12-rounder with Tony Tucker. Well, check it. It was also a 12-round decision over Bone Crusher Smith in a title fight. We have with us a presentation by the World Boxing Association of a Joe Lewis heavy This picture right here is really one of the more exciting of one of the more exciting moments in all of sports today. Just watching uh, this athlete waiting to get it on. He's like a, a combination of a Pavarotti clearing his throat and a bomb ready to go off. This is the worst part because waiting, you want to get the fight on. You don't want to wait around for the ceremony. You just want to get into the ring and then start the fight. Tyson has managed to completely ignore the entreaties of Japanese officials in the ring who want him to participate in this belt ceremony. He wants to do the belting right now. And it's always tougher on the challenger because he has to wait. We're 
told that Mike was, as is often his custom, pounding the wall in his dressing room with his fists in the half hour prior to his departure to come out to the ring. That was the case before his four-round knockout of Larry Holmes. It was the case before his 91-second destruction of Michael Spinks. Now up to the ring announcer, Jenny Lennon Jr. for pre-fight introductions. We welcome you as Take Ten Boxing Promotions in association with Don King Productions brings you the main event. 12 rounds of boxing for the heavyweight championship of the world. Introducing the promoters, Mr. Akihiko Honda and promoter extraordinaire, Don, only in America, King. This bout is sanctioned by the World Boxing Association and the World Boxing Council in conjunction with the Japan Boxing Commission. Representing the WBA President, Gilberto Mendoza. The Vice President and Supervisor, Dr. Manuel Virgilio Aispurua. And the chairman of the World Championship Committee is Dr. Elias Cordova. Representing the WBC, we have the President, Jose Suleiman, the Supervisor, Elias Ganem. Representing the Japan Boxing Commission, the Chief Commissioner, Makoto Hosaka. Introducing to you the officials as they are appointed, the ringside physician, Dr. K. Suzuki. Timekeeper at the bell, Richie Hirano. The judges, Larry Rosadia. Ken Morita and Masakazu Uchida. Now presenting to you the referee in charge of this main event, Octavio Meran. Tale of the tape, you heard Mike Tyson say before the fight that he's always at a physical disadvantage against his opponents, and here it is again, height, weight, and reach all in Buster Douglas's favor. But Tyson, once again, is in great shape at 220 and a half pounds. Rules for the fight, the one significant rule, and it is unusual, the three knockdown rule is in effect here. Again, Jimmy Lennon. Yeah. His record, 29 wins, 4 defeats, 1 loss, 1 draw, with 19 wins by way of knockout. He's ranked number 3 by the WBC, number 4 contender in the WBA. Please welcome the challenger, James Buster Douglas. And his opponent, the defending champion on my left, really needing no introduction the world over. He's ready to fight out of the red corner and attired in black trunks. Hailing from Catskill, New York, he weighed in at a ready 220 and one half pounds. His outstanding record, 37 wins, no defeats, with 33 big wins by way of knockout. He's making his 10th defense of the heavyweight crown, introducing the undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, the one and only Iron Mike Tyson! Give me a break, please. Gentlemen, remember the dressing room instruction. Shake hands and good luck both. Everybody out? Douglas insists that he's going to shock the world in this fight. If he should upset Mike Tyson, it would make the shocks in Eastern Europe seem like local ward politics. He would shock most of the world if he could make it into the middle rounds. Well, he has convinced Mike Tyson this very first round. Buster Douglas is a conventional fighter who likes to work behind a stiff left jab. I'm 
surprised to see Buster moving so well. I mean, he's really, I think the weight has made a difference in his upper body movement, in his legs. Keep that jab out there. He wants to top Mike up every time Mike gets inside. And the problem a lot of fighters make is the fact they dropped that right hand of theirs and Mike Tyson's left hook is no cupcake. Keep in mind that Carl Williams looked pretty loose and relaxed against Tyson until Tyson hit him with a body punch about 45 seconds into the bout. Mike has not yet gone to the body against Douglas here. Well, the left jab of Buster Douglas is incredible because he's one of the few guys I've seen other than Larry Holmes and maybe a couple, a handful of guys that can put a guy down with the left jab. So the left jab is a key weapon for Buster Douglas. He fought a sculpted Adonis named Mike Williams on the undercard of Tyson Spinks and floored him twice in the early rounds with the left jab. Hey, hey, hey. We're almost 90 seconds in, and as yet, Tyson has done no real damage to Buster Douglas. Douglas punching on the break, and he gets a warning from Octavio Meran. Now Tyson begins to step in behind the left jab. He landed twice. Watch the right hand of Buster Douglas. But the problem I've still seen is the fact he steady, he steady drops that right hand as he throws it. Threw a snappy looking right hand lead. And then tied up and on rushing Tyson. See, Mike has to be careful also because Mike's standing in front of him too. Couple of right hands by Douglas. Tyson landing the jab again, and Mike misses with the right. With taller fighters, Mike has to really work extra hard to get inside. And see, this is to Buster Douglas' advantage. Okay. Left jab lands again for Tyson. He has not yet gone to the body. Against Frank Bruno, Tyson basically forgot Bruno's ribcage for the first four rounds and paid a bit of a price for it. Once he went to the body in round five, the fight was over pretty quickly. She does not allow Mike to work his body. He's trying to tie him up inside. In fact, he's doing a pretty good job here. Another right hand lead by Douglas, and Tyson lands the left hook. That was a good round for Douglas, and I gave it to him. Probably the best round I've ever seen him fight. That was a very docile round for Mike Tyson, throwing only 13 punches. But a number, a number of jabs, excuse me, but a number of fighters have had good first rounds against Tyson, and that was it. Let's see if Douglas can sustain it, Jim. Keep in mind that Tyson, a little more than three weeks ago, was knocked down in training by Greg Page. And there was some talk here that he was not as sharp as he has been for previous bouts. You never know until he's in the ring. Hey, hey, don't do that. Every time that Mike comes inside, apparently uh, Douglas has been doing a lot of watching of films because he takes a move. He steps to his right, give a little angle. Douglas giving as good as he gets inside right there. He outlanded Tyson by punch stat computations. 22 punches to eight. Around Very one. hard right hand by Douglas inside that Tyson walked right into. And right through, I might add. Left hook by Tyson was partially blocked by the right glove of Buster Douglas. We talked about intimidation before the fight. Douglas has so far shown no signs of being intimidated. See, what, what 
they want from Tyson's corner, they want to see more upper body movement and also more punches thrown as opposed to the one big punch. And that's what Mike Tyson's doing now. Another right hand lead lands for Douglas. Douglas is not afraid. That is apparent. And what's happening, Douglas started to get his punches off first, which is the key to boxing. You get your punches off first. He's got pretty quick hands for a big man. Well, the lighter Douglas is, the faster his hands are, the more accurate his punches are. Not a lot of power. As Larry referred to when he talked about Tyson walking right through the solid right. I wouldn't necessarily say that because I think Tyson has a pretty good chin. And he's compact. And what's happening, every time Douglas throws a shot, in fact, it was a good body shot by Mike Tyson. First good body shot he's thrown. Tyson keeps that chin tucked in. As you watch Buster Douglas try to tie Mike Tyson up inside, remember that fighters such as James Tillis and Mitch Green and Bone Crusher Smith have thoroughly frustrated Tyson at times with just that tactic. What I'm seeing now is the fact that Douglas is getting Mike Tyson to reach in. When you reach in, that's what Another happened. good right hand and a good right uppercut and two more good rights by Douglas. I don't think I've ever seen Tyson absorb that kind of a four or five punch combination before in his professional career. Now, Mike is not going on, he's not attacking Buster Douglas, which indicates that there is some respect here. And also, and also a little puzzlement, Ray. He just doesn't seem to know how to go about it. That's another good round that I gave to Buster Douglas. I don't think there's any doubt about that one. Close the gap, Mike. You ain't inside enough. All right? Come on now. Let's just say this is coming. Be calm. Just like you on the pads. Relax. Same thing. Hand me bouncing inside. Get inside. Don't lay back, Mike. Remember? Real hard pressure, Mike. Even if you get in there. You just Now let's take a look at that combination. Douglas firing away. That right was high. Came back with a nice short left. A left jab. Came up with a right and a left that missed. And there he comes back. Still punchy. Ordinarily, in that kind of situation, Ray, Tyson likes to duck, let the other man fire and finish, and then come back with his punch. And, and what Douglas did so cleverly was to smother him and not give him a chance to throw back. And that's what I'm surprised about, that Mike has not retaliated after his opponent throws his combination. Listen to these numbers, guys. By punch stat computations, in the first two rounds, Buster Douglas landed 52 punches, Mike Tyson 16. Well, I don't know if he's going to shock the world, but he sh but Douglas has shocked me so far. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Tyson now is really serious now. He's really, really rushing this man coming in. But they may fall in the hands of Buster Douglas. Good left to the body by Tyson. That's the kind of blow which has done a lot of damage to previous challenges. You hear his corner, Tyson's corner saying, be smart, work your way in. Another good right, but Tyson comes right through it. Douglas still outlanding Tyson, outthrowing him. Okay. Again, Jeff, the, the yellow from Tyson's corner to work your right. way in, not to walk in there because that jeopardizes you, put you in a lot of trouble. Douglas accurate with the jab. Miran told him, telling him not to hold and hit. Now what Douglas can't do, he can't allow himself to get frustrated and try to exchange with Tyson. That could be fatal. I'm surprised I don't see as many body shots thrown by Mike Tyson. That would bring those hands down of Buster Douglas. Right hand by Tyson moving in. Left and a right by Douglas. Tyson seems a little more precise in this round as he tries to move in, but it is still Douglas who is throwing and landing more often. Working behind the jab, as is his custom. Those right-hand leads have been very effective. They have been, but also you got to get those hands back up. What Douglas is doing, he's not allowing Mike to get his punches off to the midsection. Although there was a right hand to the ribcage there. Again.
again, the yellow from Tyson's corner combination, not one punch. And that's why Doug is able to get his combinations off because he's only expecting a one punch retaliation. Tyson's trying to leap in behind the left hook. He landed that one under Douglas's chin, near the middle of the chest. Douglas with another right hand to the top of Tyson's head. Again, Tyson's corner yelling, you've got to punch inside. Good solid left jab by Douglas. Tyson raised him with the right. One inside. Don't you stand there looking at the work. You're not closing the gap, Mike. You gotta get inside by jabbing and moving your head. When you get in the inside, you gotta punch. Alright? Come on now. Punch, Mike. Jab, 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 overhand, right, come back into your foot. Okay? Relax. Oh, you're too flat footed in there. Right. Okay? Get Trust in what you know. Do it. Let it go. <clears throat> Don't be so cautious with the punches. Let them back them up. Keep sweet, keep sweet. This is the first time since Kevin Rooney hasn't been with Mike Tyson that he's needed some answers from the corner. Let's see if he's got the right answer. They're trying to make him just fight, not look to just wing big punches, expecting Douglas to fall the first time he lands something. And the man who does most of the talking in Tyson's corner and who leans forward to whisper in his ear is Aaron Snow. If you watch what Douglas is doing now, he's trying to double that jab up. And see, the second jab is not really hard, but it blinds you for a fraction of a second. That's when you drop the right hand. And you notice Douglas is trying to throw not just one jab, but two jabs. There was an expression on Tyson's face, and uh, I can relate to that, because sometimes you get into the ring, Jeff, you just don't have it. Things just don't click in. And maybe that's what he's feeling now. He's just not on. Well, we're in round four, and a lot of ringside observers didn't expect the fight to go this far. It should be pointed out that stamina has been a problem for Buster Douglas throughout his career. And in the last two weeks, he's been bothered by respiratory illness here. He was taking penicillin just this past week and antihistamines. You have to wonder how far he can go at this level level of effectiveness. Douglas still landing the jab and then stepping away. Tyson seems less aggressive than is normally the case. Perhaps a little frustrated. Well, Buster Douglas definitely is inspired because of the tragedy, the passing of his mother. And reminds me of when Howard Davis' mother passed during the 1976 Olympics. It really motivated him because he was doing it for mom. Everyone in Douglas's camp said that would be the case today. It was extremely close to his mother. Right hand by Douglas, right on Tyson's chin. The double jabs, especially with a big man, is difficult to penetrate. Always difficult to penetrate. Critics of Tyson say that since the departure of Kevin Rooney, he has been increasingly easy to hit. There's very little head movement here today. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Mike Tyson is Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson is a natural fighter. You don't think that the loss of Rooney as trainer has made any difference? I don't really believe that. But one thing about it, I guess that must you know, be a little contradictory, but normally to keep the same family, it's always a plus. But then, then again, sometimes you must change. As you did. Yes. Douglas, Douglas again with a left and a right. And now Tyson lands a right hand and backs Buster up, but here he comes. Mike throws, when Mike throws his punch, Mike is dropping his hands, which is very dangerous. Well, if Mike 
Tyson, who loves pigeons, was looking for a pigeon in this fight. He hasn't found him. You gotta use that seven to get inside, Mike, and back this guy up, and you gotta move that head. All right? Get that rhythm. And, a, and there, of course, is Amanda Holyfield, who has a guarantee of $12 million to fight Mike Tyson in June. And right now, that $12 million isn't in the bank. Okay. You come on, you want all four rounds. You, want you got to hold round. your concentration. Now you go. You come back. Everything will be there. Everything will be there, Tim. Come back. You okay. no work at Douglas, people. Tell Douglas he's won all four rounds. And. Shockingly, I agree with them. Trainer J.D. McCauley and manager John Johnson very calm in the Douglas corner. He's thrown 114 jabs in the bout, and by punch stat computations, he has landed almost half of them. Extremely effective working behind the left jab. Buster Douglas. Now Tyson lands a jab. This is the round in which Tyson turned things around against Frank Bruno. Right hand by Douglas lands again. He's been very quick with it. Oh, man. No. Two points. Douglas get the breathing here. Very smart. Very, very smart. He throws his combination. And then he ties him up. There's just no head movement there, Ray. Mike is a stationary target for this guy. Well, that's the uh, that's the reason his corner is so petrified, because they see that Mike has become somewhat of a stationary target, directly in front of Buster Douglas. That's why the right hand's been hit later. Now, this, this is totally uncharacteristic of Mike Tyson. He's right there in front of his opponent. Not doing anything. Just reaching in. That's our right hand again. This one happens every time. The Another right hand, and now Tyson seems to be wobbled. Mike is not throwing back. Buster Douglas is completely dominating this round with jabs and right crosses. The, what's going to do some damage now? Buster Douglas throw a double cut. Tyson leaps inside with a left hook. No, no. One punch at a time, though. That's all he's throwing. There's the uppercut. Absolutely, the opening is there. Buster no Douglas is so relaxed, and this should save him in the later rounds if he should go that far. It appears, Ray, that James Douglas is fighting a master fight in the geometry of the fight. Every time that Tyson appears ready to throw, he either ties him up like he just does, or he just backs off a little bit and ruins his timing. Thus, thus far, he's fought the perfect fight because he's not being a stationary target, although he's not really uh, running around. There's a lot of swelling above Mike Tyson's left eye, and it is partially closed. And that is from the right-hand leads that Buster Douglas has landed almost at will throughout the fight. That left jab of Buster Douglas is a measuring stick. Very strong. Watch it come out, and then he drops the right hand. Well, I think you'd have to say this is the most trouble Mike Tyson has ever been in at this stage of a title defense. This is the most trouble Jimmy's ever been at any stage of a title defense. Now, Mike doesn't get hit by Lee right hand. That's another round for Buster Douglas. And he even dominated the exchange after the bell. You remember, at the top of the show, I said the good news is Buster Douglas always fights his best against the best opponents. This is even better news than that from his point of view. And he has swelled up Mike Tyson's eye and is dominating the fight right now. <laughs> Now, just watch this combination. A long right, a left jab hook somewhere in there, and he has been doing this over and over. Every time Tyson wants to, is willing to take a punch and he wants to fire back, Douglas fires back before he can. You begin to file through your memory for the biggest upsets in heavyweight championship fight history. I, I don't think there would be anything like this. I agree. This would create a new standard of upsets if this went on. Clay and Braddock, not as big as this. Hey, hey. Hey. Step back. Step back. All right. 
question is the stamina of uh, Douglas, as you pointed out. Stamina has never been a problem for Mike Tyson opponents in the past. <laughs> and I would question the stamina of Buster Douglas at this kind of pace, Larry, but again, he is so relaxed there. By punch stat computations in the fifth round, Buster Douglas outlanded Mike Tyson three to one, 33 punches to 11. If anything, his dominance is increasing. Again, the leadoff rights, I'm very surprised they're landing like they are. Tyson landed an uppercut inside. And another right hand uppercut by Tyson. Douglas doesn't appear hurt. Well, as long as Douglas stay there, he's, he, he's going to play right to Mike Tyson's hands. But the thing about all of this, uh, Jim and Ray, is, is that he's never given Tyson a chance to use those amazingly fast combinations. Even when he gets hit, in one punch and he smothers him, or he fires back. The combination which destroyed Bruno, and which has been so effective against a lot of opponents, is the right hand to the body, followed immediately by the uppercut. And that punch lands when a guy is against the ropes, or in a corner. And Douglas has not been there. Tyson finally blocked the right hand lead. Sorry? Sorry? Little more peekaboo defense from Tyson now as he is clearly aware of the closing left eye. And that becomes a factor, especially for the very first time. Experience plays a major role in that kind of handicap. One of the things that his, his great mentor, Cus D'Amato, used to tell him was, it's no virtue to get hit, keep your gloves up. And, and Mike Tyson in recent fights, which have been so easy for him, has forgotten that advice and has kept his hands down. Yeah, now you see he's so worried that he's going back to what was called the peekaboo style of defense. He's got his gloves back up again. All right. What I don't see is the upper body movement from Tyson, and that's why Douglas is able to land those kind of punches. No head movement. Tyson winging inside with a left and a right. Douglas again ties him up. Lead off right once again. Mike needs to pick the tempo of the fight up. He has to make Douglas work. So far, he has not done that. Douglas not quite as quick and active in this round as he has been in previous rounds, but there's very little drop-off. And the champion looks frustrated. Missed with the leaping left. A confident Douglas goes back to his corner. Well ahead on points, you have to assume. I gave that round to Tyson, the first one I have. You're still laying on the outside on this guy. You got to back this guy up, all right? You got to go to his body. Once you get inside, you got to punch, Mike. You definitely got to punch when you get in there, all right? When you get inside, don't look to hold. Use your hands. Hey. Set down your knees. You got your two punches, bro. Grease, maybe some grease. Grease, grease, grease. Just the right hand. Come on, what does she do now, baby? Stay alert. It's your fight. Uh, your show. You got understand it. me? Grease, baby. You got it one. Just stay in control. Just stay alert. Oh, control. This fucking guy's scared to death. That jab. Put your shit on him. That jab is a shot, baby. The jab yeah. right here. Yeah. All right. Past the midway point of the scheduled 12 rounds. Now, few at ringside thought that Buster Douglas would make it this far. He has made it this far with a so far dominant showing over heavyweight champion Mike Tyson. If this fight was being held in the States, the crowd would be in an uproar right now. Here they are eerily silent. Douglas continues to outland Tyson at close quarters and then to tie him up. It has made an enormous difference in the talent of Buster Douglas by sharing out those pounds. He's so much quicker, he's so much agile, and he's so much accurate now. Buster needs to move a little bit more. He's standing, he's start, now he's starting to become stationary. Great, great. 
Low blow by Tyson. Miran was behind Douglas and didn't see it. Douglas with another right hand, looping over the top. It's a great tempo for Douglas. Moses' hands are down. Tyson still leaping and lunging behind the left hook, desperately trying to change the tempo of the fight. Another low blow. This time, Mayron saw. Another right hand lead for Douglas, partially connected. Left jabs right on Tyson's face. This is the first time I've seen a big man in the ring with Tyson use his physical attributes to height and reach advantage. Tyson's corner liked what it saw with the left uppercut. It was almost 25 years ago when a 7-1 to betting underdog named Cassius Clay thoroughly frustrated and whipped a Sonny Liston in Miami Beach at a time when Liston was regarded as invincible. You have to go back that far to find something this shocking in a heavyweight title fight. No combination about Mike Tyson. Combination, Don't relax. Grease. Double your jab Grease. every time it comes to you, and the right hand's only going to travel. Beautiful work, champ. Beautiful work. Keep busting stay on strong. that eye. Keep stay strong, but stay, stay alert. So everything else is in your ballpark, champ. Now, this is an event that happened in training. It was dismissed. Tyson has been down before in training. Nobody takes it too seriously. But there you saw Greg Page step in with a right hand and Tyson go down. In fairness, I don't know how you can relate that to what happened here, except that Mike Tyson is anything but the dyna the dynamo this dynamic terror that we're used to seeing buster douglas has neutralized him frustrated him beaten him to the punch by punch count statistics tyson is averaging only 23 punches around he's going to have to step up the activity if he's going to turn things around here Red, that knockdown in training Red took King. place just a little bit more than three weeks ago everybody from don king on down in tyson's camp said it was no play acting it was for real off this performance, I think you'd have to say yes. He's definitely for real. The graphic you saw between rounds demonstrated the huge disparity in jab effectiveness. Buster Douglas, thoroughly dominant in that department so far. Another solid straight left jab right to the middle of Mike Tyson's face. I'm watching the legs of Buster Douglas. There's a lot of spring to his legs, beauty springs. There's a lot of life to his legs. We're in the eighth round, folks. A heavyweight champion regarded as completely invincible in these circumstances is in big trouble. Get it off! Could you imagine? Uh, Buster
Mr. Douglas, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world? Well, he's not only yet, Jim, but I tell you, he's put a good account of himself up. It boggles the mind. Well, he, he's asking some questions of Tyson that Tyson hasn't been asked before. In the second half of a fight, he's got to come back and win it. Look at the punches. These right hand leads are not diminishing in effectiveness, guys. He is still landing just about all of them. Double jabs, lead off right hands. And now he's on the back mic up. No, no, no. Hitting on the break. Moran didn't say a word to him about it. There's a little swelling under the left eye now of Mike Tyson. Still beating Tyson to the punch, Greg. Well, there's just no question which is the more confident fighter now. You see how easily Douglas is dominating the action inside. And Tyson is holding on. I've never, never seen this happen before with Mike Tyson. He's always been an initiator. Here he's against the ropes. I've never seen. And there's a right hand uppercut and down goes Douglas. As suddenly as that. Can he beat the count? He got a little overconfident. Got a little loosey-goosey. Still wobbly. Let's see what Mike can do to finish. And the bell ends to save Buster Douglas at the end of round eight. Well, Tyson needed something like that desperately, and like a real champion, he came through with it. It was though he baited Douglas in. I thought he was out of it. Let's take a look. Tyson is backing up. Now, perhaps he's trying to bait him to come in and to relax, because that was the effect of it. Came off the ropes with that terrific right uppercut. What a shot. Shades of Frank Bruno. Let's see if what Douglas has when he comes out for this round. Second down. Second down. Round nine. He's had 60 seconds to recover. Clearly he was out on his feet as the bell sounded. And Tyson is trying to find out immediately if his head is clear. This is when Douglas should really do a great deal of clinch and tying his head and trying to clear his head. Hey, hey, don't do that. Left hand lands by Tyson. Right to the body, he tries the uppercut again and misses. Douglas comes back with a left and a right. Three solid shots right on Tyson's face. Just missed with the uppercut on the break. And there goes Tyson inside and up and under again. defense at this moment they are just trading shots and now both men look a little weary now if i was douglas i would move now just move around just try to clear ahead clear those cobwebs tyson misses with the right over the top and mike has slowed down maybe a tiny bit arm weary this is high drama, and the crowd here is greeting it by and large with stony silence. Probably disbelief, Jim. They came to see Godzilla, and the wrong guy appeared to be Godzilla until that knockdown. The left eye of Mike Tyson is nearly closed now. Shades of Ray Leonard against Tommy Hearns. Douglas coming back for the left and right. Head. Tyson is wobbling. Tyson needs the ropes for support. Douglas wailing away. Without the ropes, Mike would have gone down. Plenty of time left in the round. weary from the pitched battle. Mike Tyson was on the verge of going down. And again the champion wobbles back to the ropes. Solid right hand by Douglas. Action 
Tyson is hurt, his eye is closing, and he is behind in this fight. Surge of, of strength and life in Buster Douglas. Come on now. Let's go. Let's take a look. Two lefts and just Mike Buster Douglas is just going at him. And what he's doing is what other fighters who have had Tyson in trouble have backed off to admire their work. And when he got him in trouble, he went at him. Tyson has taken some big punches. James Douglas is not a great puncher, but, with, but he's a 230-pound man throwing some hard stuff. And Tyson, to his credit, has stood in there and took, taken the punches. Oh, what a right hand by Tyson to begin the 10th round. Emphasis on man, Larry. This has been an inspired, courageous performance by a man whose mother has died within the past month, whose son's mother is battling a difficult kidney ailment, who had every reason to come into this bout depressed and downtrodden, chosen by no one to have a chance of getting out of the first few rounds, and he has thoroughly dominated Mike Tyson with the exception of the moment when he went down. Well, the other day, John Johnson's uh, Douglas manager and Douglas himself said, I am a new person now, and apparently he is. He's been a whole different person than the one every boxing expert expected to see here. It appears that Tyson is virtually a one-eyed fighter at this point. A desperate one-eyed fighter. Rolling willingly just to try to get in the shot that will finish things in Oh, the uppercut. What an uppercut by Douglas. And down goes Tyson. It's over. It's over. Mike Tyson has been knocked out. Unbelievable. This makes Cinderella look like a sad story. What Buster Douglas has done here tonight. Let's go ahead and call it the biggest upset in the history of heavyweight championship fights. Say it now, gentlemen. James Buster Douglas, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. I would be willing to say it's the greatest upset in boxing history. There seems to be a little pandemonium here. In, in Las Vegas, they wouldn't even put up any odds on this fight. And suddenly, Mike Tyson, uh, perceived as this giant monolith, has been reduced to being another heavyweight champion who got defeated. Snowell saying to Tyson, who apparently was unaware, you were counted out. K.O. This victory for Buster Douglas could not have been more richly deserved. Well, Douglas did well. A lot of guys have done, a few guys have done in the past. They've hurt Tyson and didn't take advantage of it. Buster Douglas, inspired by the death of his mother, came on very strong. He had Tyson in trouble a few times. The uppercut. That pretty much was the uh, the bread and butter for this fight here. It wasn't just the power of the punches, but it was the accuracy and the number of punches that Buster Douglas threw. Sustained accuracy all through the bout. For 10 straight rounds, he was sharper and crisper and more accurate than the champion. so impossible to believe that Buster Douglas would knock out Mike Tyson, you might have begun to say in the middle rounds that it was nearly inevitable as Tyson's eye closed and as he began to wobble in the inside exchanges. But nevertheless, 
interference is just given the history of the champion you continued to wait and wait for the moment when he would with sudden fierceness be able to turn things around and he did knock douglas down with an uppercut at the end of round eight but douglas came back to outclass tyson in face-to-face -face exchanges throughout round nine and then in the tenth he took over once again and finished Tyson with the combination you saw. That was a turning point, Jim. When he was knocked down in the eighth round, Douglas was, and he came back strong in the ninth round. Ladies and gentlemen, a heart as big as Japan's economic power. 23 seconds in round number 10. The winner by way of knockout, the new heavyweight champion of the world, James It's all yours. All right, I'm with Buster Douglas. Buster, Buster Douglas, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Can you believe that? Uh, yeah, it's happening. Is it, oh, take this out. Why did it happen, James? Because I wanted it. Why? Why did you win this fight that nobody on the planet gave you? Because it's mother. In what mother. way? God bless her heart. Let him go, Larry. After he got knocked down, I said, you go. can't let, let him go. beat him. You want to go, John? No, let him talk. Let him Number talk. one, boy. Well, I mean, are you saying, I mean, you came out here more animated than we've ever seen you, more focused than we've ever seen you, and you're crediting it to the fact that the death of your mother just what? Focused your mind what? I was already focused, you know. Well, what surprised you from the get-go? What did you? What were you going to try to do from the get-go? That's what I did with his ass. You know, I mean, you come to fight, I come to fight. I told you in the, in the room, I said, that it was time for James Jones to come out, out of the closet. But it seems you had but a... You know, I told you that I also had times where I had great fights that would come back with two or three different fights that was mediocre, you know, and I would leave a lot of doubt. I don't blame you guys. You guys go on what you see, you understand? But I know, and my people know, that he what was the real great. James Douglas is all about. Every every challenger you, for Mike Tyson says the same thing, but you did something in there. I told to, you. I told to you to neutralize him. Why am I no? Why am I no? Thank you, Jesus. All right, just one moment. I told, you, I told you in the room. I said but you they weren't James Douglas. But you didn't let him get off. It seemed every time he wanted to throw a punch, either you beat him to it or you smothered him. Was that the idea? Well, I just did what I did. You know, I went out there and fought my fight. All right, now, yeah, very instinctive. Very instinctive. All right, now you had him but you get knocked down at the well yeah you know and that, that was a good shot i mean you know like i said before a man over 200 pounds has a good shot did he did you get careless did you think i you think had so him? that was just starting to get real relaxed you know and i got i got shook i mean well, i got hurt, hit and i came back you know sucked it up because i knew i had him also you know i knew he was every time he would try to get off i would come back you know and, and offset him by beating to his punch you know because mike well early early in the fight you know mike would come out, you know, and, and throw his big shots, you know, so what I would do is just, you know, go go with him and come back with my own, you know, and another thing, I was very relaxed, I wasn't afraid of the man, I feared no man, because I believe in God, that's the only man I fear, you know, thank God, I give this praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, but you, but you but you know, you know that you're in there with Mike Tyson. After the knockdown, did you think he would come on, or did you know you had to stop his momentum at that point? Well, yeah, I knew he was going to come because he's a champion. I mean, he was going to suck it up and come and get me, you know? And, 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 and I was ready for it. I was, aware, I was aware of everything, you know, I was totally aware of everything. And, Dad, this one is for you. I love you. Well, could you see the confusion in his eyes? You, you, one of his well, eyes I was see, closed. Well, I seen that early on. You know, because of the stiff jab. You know, I was just letting him run into the jab because, you know, the speed, I have I have tremendous speed. I have tremendous, tr tremendous stability. As I told you earlier in the uh, room, I said, well, you know, I'm conditioned to go 12 rounds. And that's what I was conditioned for. That's why I was able to get up from the knockdown. You know, it was a good shot. You know, I, I gave him all respect for that. You know, but when I got up, it was like, well, it's time to go ahead and get him out of there. You hit him with Because I got careless. I got careless, Larry. You know, I started, you know, getting in control of everything. And then all of a sudden, he caught me with a good shot. You took some fearsome, he took some fearsome punches. Yeah, yeah. This is a dream, man. This is a truly 
a dream. I swear to God. This is a dream. This is a dream, man. Put the belt on. Put it on. This is truly a dream, man. I watched you on HBO a thousand times putting belts on guys or you know, interviewing guys, and I said one day it's gonna be me. One day it's gonna be me. And thank God that it was me today. You, you, I swear to God. you hit him with some fearsome punches. I hit him some great shots. Early and he Larry, didn't I, know. Well, yeah. Well, that's all. Well, that's great. That's great because you understand. Like my dad said, you know, you hit him with shots. Let him take it. Like, oh, okay. You want to take a shot. Guy. Yeah, be a tough guy. Just keep chopping on him. Just keep chopping on him. And eventually he's going to go. And that's what happened. As you've seen over there, he was flat on his ass. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I think that tells the whole story, Jim. Great. Mike Tyson, flat on his whatever you want to call it. Jim. Rodney, I love you, Rodney. Love you. James Buster Douglas, 29 years old, Columbus, Ohio, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Well, if you're a sports fan, you know you've seen it dozens of times. How many times has a story so sentimental, so poignant, so emotionally powerful, seemed to simply take over reality and tell itself? Surely the sentimentalist in all of us wanted to believe that in the wake of the death of his mother, amid the difficulties being suffered by the mother of his child, James Buster Douglas could step forth today with a performance unlike any other in his entire career and compete with Mike Tyson. Surely the realist in all of us said no, that wasn't really possible. But indeed it was possible, and it happened. And an inspired Buster Douglas thoroughly dominated Mike Tyson and courageously came back from an eighth round knockdown to turn around and knock the champion out himself. Larry Merchant, it has to be one of the greatest and most memorable moments in the history of the sport. Well, it certainly is. Uh, I wish it had been in the States after all this, but Buster Douglas is an athlete. He played football and in, in, in high and basketball in high school. He had a scholarship as a power forward to a junior college. He has had some ability. And I was very moved by the way he said he did it also for his dad. His dad was a terrific, spirited fighter, middleweight and light heavyweight, and was never satisfied with his son, who seemed to be so casual about it. But for whatever human reason possible, for someone to surpass his own his own ability to surpass uh, anything that he can ever do before in this moment at this moment uh, that's what makes this sport uh, so terrific incidentally you're probably wondering if we are going to hear from Mike Tyson we sent our Sugar Ray Leonard to follow Tyson to his dressing room to seek an interview with the former heavyweight champion, and Ray has been turned down. So apparently Mike will have nothing to say to us on this live telecast about his devastating 10th round knockout defeat today at the hands of the new undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, James Buster Douglas, a fight that I have already called the biggest upset in the history of heavyweight championship boxing history, and which Larry has gone me one better with by calling it the biggest upset in boxing history. You know, uh, uh, Jim, I was just reminded, uh, I've gone to the Tokyo Fish Market, which is one of the greatest spectacles on Earth. As far as you can see, huge frozen tuna, that, because the Japanese love tuna so much. And it, going into this fight, I thought, or, or when I was down there looking at it, I thought, well, Buster Douglas is just another frozen tuna. A guy there that doesn't have, we've never seen him with this much life, uh, this much animation, this much determination. But boxing is the theater of the unexpected, and when you least expect it, we had the unexpected. Speaking of unexpected, and why you never take anything for granted in a prize fight, Larry, look at these judges' scores. To the point in the bout at which Douglas knocked Tyson out, one judge, Larry Rosadilla of the United States, had Buster Douglas leading 88 to 82. But look at this. One Japanese judge, Morita, had Tyson leading 87 to 86. Hard for us to imagine what fight he was watching. The other Japanese judge had the fight even, 86-86. So if it had Thank continued that way through the last two rounds, there was at least a chance of a draw or even a decision in favor of Mike Tyson, which I think we'll both agree would have been thoroughly unjust. And the biggest injustice in the history of boxing if that had happened. I just think, judging from the reaction of the crowd here, is that they just couldn't believe what they were seeing. 
I mean, the Japanese basically came out to see Michael Jackson, Madonna, the Rolling Stones. They came out to see a great performance by a, a, a star on the world stage. And it just, you just couldn't get their minds clicked into what they were seeing. And that's why I said earlier in the fight, early on, at the, before the show, the importance of expectations in a fight. And that how, how that shapes what you're, what you're watching. Sometimes it takes a long time to believe what you're actually seeing in a prize fight. In case you've just joined us, you missed a shocker. The once undefeated and undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, Mike Tyson, is no more. 37 and 1 now, instead of 38 and 0. He was knocked out 23 seconds into the 10th round by a journeyman named James Buster Douglas, who now, at age 29, a few weeks after the death of his mother, and in the wake of learning about the life-threatening illness of the mother of his child, came up with the most inspired performance of his boxing career, and is now the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Muhammad Ali coined the phrase that Buster Douglas made into a promise in Tokyo. I can still see and hear Ali, after upsetting Sonny Liston, yelling to singer Sam Cooke at ringside, Sam, did I shock the world. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for appearing with us at our studios. And before we start, could you uh, shake hands and come out talking here? <laughs> Both of you shocked the world in Tokyo. Buster, you in the ring, and Mike, you outside of the ring after the fight. Let's get to the controversy first and get through that. The impression left with all the business about the long count is that you and Don King tried to use your influence to either turn the decision around or to avoid it. And that after there was this huge public outcry he decided to take a U-turn, a flip-flop, and say, we didn't quite mean that. What we meant was we wanted a rematch. Give us your spin on what that was all about. Well, Larry, if you could recollect, we were, no one was protesting, especially not myself. I was just um, um, pointing at the fact what had happened. The referee, he took, I, I, I gave my comment of what had happened. I mean, by no means, Buster fought a great fight. You don't want to take that away from him. You know what I mean? It would be cheap. You couldn't consider yourself champion if somebody defaulted like that. But you know what I mean? He deserves being champion of the world, and I commend him on effort. You know what I mean? But you know what I mean? I by no means made a protest on changing the decision. You did say afterwards, I consider myself still the champion. I don't think what happened was fair. No, I said it wasn't fair what happened. But then again, how many things in boxing is not fair? You know what I mean? I, was, I had 37 good nights. But then again, I could say when I say I'm champion because I still consider myself the best fighter in the world. Take us through the process. You go back to your dressing room after the fight. How did you first hear about this supposed long count? How was it presented to you? What was your reaction? Um, before, like, the fight, like, when the fight was, um, when I went in the dressing room, I, I, I commented, I said, um, that, count was, that count was a little long, I said. You did? Yeah, I said, that, I thought that count was a little long, not making a big deal, but then people that came and protested the situation, like the Japanese officials had came in, and the WBC and the um, WBA, and they made a big issue of the situation. But by all means, nobody's crying over spilled milk, you know what I mean? Buster, you know what I mean, if he believes he's the champion of the world, we'll do it again. Buster, you take us through the process you went. When did you first hear that there was a protest being lodged? And what were your thoughts at that moment? Uh, once I got back to the hotel, I really didn't uh, understand, you know, uh, what the situation was totally about. Because as far as I knew, I was up before the count of 10. And they were saying it was a long count. And to my knowledge, it was at 6 when well, I picked it up at 6. Did your manager, John Johnson, tell you about this? Yeah, it was What John. did he say to you? What did you say to him? He said that Tyson and King were protesting the count in the eighth round. Was there confusion at that moment? Was there fear that the, the fight could be voided? Or did, that, or did that happen later? No, it was, well, yeah, it was confusion. Uh, I didn't know exactly what uh, the deal was. 
Because all I was concerned with was getting my belts. When you heard that the WBA and the WBC were withholding judgment on the entire fight, were you afraid that there was some political thing going on here that would cost you your victory? Well, basically, I thought that, um, you know, it was bogus. I really didn't uh, put any stock in it. And I thought, I figured that if it was, if it came down to me being stripped of the titles and that the public would know who the real heavyweight champion was, they would recognize me because they seen the results of the fight. When you finally did get home to Columbus, and there was still a furor and it was still unknown what was going to happen. Were your fears raised at that time? You know, I was a disappointment due to the fact that I didn't receive the championship belts. I mean, I was declared the winner in the ring, but yet, you know, I only received one belt. And then once, once I received the belt and got back to the hotel, they said that it was being protested and that the WBC and the WBA wasn't sanctioned in the fight. Did it ruin the party for you? Did it ruin the best time of your life in some way? In one respect it did. In another, the victory itself was still, I still felt that I won the fight. Uh, but it was just that it wasn't completed. Being completed was receiving the belts. Mike, you're a student of boxing history, perhaps the best student I've ever known of his sport. Jack Dempsey, when he lost to Tunney, said, Honey, I forgot to duck. Uh, Muhammad Ali, when he lost to Joe Frazier, clutched his swollen jaw and said, Boy, he could sure punch better than I thought he could. The impression that this left with a lot of people is that you couldn't handle defeat. Is, is that what you wanted people to think? Not, not by all means. You know, it's so ludicrous to even make a statement like that. You know what I mean? Those things happen. You know, I, mean, I dealt with defeats all my life, being an amateur. Those things that both have fought a good fight. I fought a bad fight. We'll do it again, hopefully. What about the apologies from Don King when they finally came? Uh, did that satisfy you, or did you feel he wasn't acting in your best interest, Buster? Well, it satisfied me. Um, then, as I said in an interview before, I, I said that, you know, it was just a... You know, you never, you never can, uh, you know, Don, Don has always been upright with me, you know, he's been putting me on the cars, you know, uh, on the end of cars of world championship fights, giving me the opportunity to show my wares, and even, th even though at times it's been, it, it wasn't at the best performances, but he's always been uh, up front with me, and I've never been in a position where I could tell Don that, you know, he was wrong or that I've had, I've had the best of him, gotten the best of him. And in this situation, it seems like it's still like that because of the fact the way the, the outcome has came, you know, with all the uh, controversy that was involved in the fight. Mike, do you feel embarrassed by what Don King did, or do you feel he's fighting for your best interest? Well, I mean, he, um, from my knowledge, he did what he thought was the best thing. Personally, you know, I mean, I, I, if he felt that was right, I mean, protesting. Personally, I, you, just, you just take it as, you, as it come, you know what I mean? You talk it like you walk it, you know what I mean? By all means, I know Buster didn't beat the real Mike Tyson. He fought a great fight, no doubt, but I know. Was the controversy over the long count real or contrived? Did the referee blunder as he first admitted and then recanted? Did the true count get lost in translation? Let's go to the tape. Here's the knockdown again. We'll examine it in a moment. It's clear from this slow motion replay that the knockdown timekeeper and the referee aren't synchronized. They're off by two seconds in their counts. When the timekeeper signals two, Octavio Meron is just picking up the count. Now if you notice the elapsed time of the knockdown, it's just under 14 seconds. But we'll show you later why the referee, in the context of common practice in boxing, performed normally. He did not err. Hey, 
second, the question of whether Buster Douglas could have gotten up earlier in the count. At Mehran's count of two, Douglas bangs the canvas with his glove in disgust for getting careless, seemingly coherent. At five, he starts to get up as he listens intently to the count, then relaxes for another two counts, and he's up comfortably at nine. Third, something no one's raised. The timekeeper gave a quick count. He starts at one as soon as Douglas hits the canvas. Theoretically, he should begin his first count approximately one second after he hits the canvas. In any event, it's the referee's count that's decisive, not the timekeeper's. Seven, eight, nine. Okay. Fourth, an interesting coincidence. The elapsed time of the knockout of Mike Tyson in the 10th round. You got it. 14 seconds. So it's pretty well established that the 10 count took 14 seconds to implement for both fighters. What hasn't been fully explained is why the rest of what happened in the fight happened. Mike, let's get to the knockdowns first. You knocked him down in the eighth round. Did you feel at that very moment it was a long count? Were you angry when he got up that the bell rang? Well, somebody had told me, um, I guess it was my trainers, because I was watching the count and he said the fight is over. He, he, he stopped him. You know what I mean? Because I, I saw he was hitting the rope and he was jumping. You know, but I, I know it didn't happen. You know, and, and you know you're in the wrong. I'm in the wrong position to complain because you know regardless of it, um, it was a long count or not. Regardless, those things happen. Were you frustrated that the bell rang that you didn't have a chance to finish him? Well, you know, I mean, it took me by all at first. Yeah. What about you? If that happened in the middle of the round, Buster. Could, did you have enough left to survive? Yeah, I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't hurt. You know, I just basically, you know, I was off balance, and I just went back, fell back. But because if you see the tape when I hit the canvas, I was upset with myself of not being in the right position. And as I was leaning over, and he caught me with a shot and knocked me back. As I got up on strong legs, and I immediately picked him up in the corner, expecting for him to come charging over to finish me. So there's never been any doubt in, for a moment you that you could have gotten up w much earlier in the count. Right. Now surely you understand that knowing boxing, Mike, that he's supposed to follow the referee's count uh, and that he can't possibly know whether it's long or not. Yeah, but, but of course I'm not blaming him. Mm -hmm. I'm not blaming him, but it's, it's something um, perverted that happened at the particular time. You know I mean, you, you can't cry, you know, you can't cry over things like that because what about your knockdown, Mike? Were you shocked at this end as other people were shocked, finding well, yourself on the canvas reaching for your mouthpiece? Well, I, was, um, I wasn't incoherent because I was trying to get my mouthpiece in my mouth. But the situation was like my weird, weird clashing heads in there, and I couldn't see that well, and I couldn't see the right hand coming. I see. What about the rest of the fight, Mike? You've, looked, you said, you've both looked at the tapes. What was he able to do to you that other fighters weren't able to do? Well, he has fought a good night. He had a good fight that night. Why weren't you able to get at him? Some people have claimed you didn't have your normal fiery spirit in the ring with you that, that night. Well, regardless of the situation, why it wasn't fighting well, I mean, you can't take from the fact that, you know, Buster won the championship. Did you so feel that... 90% of Mike Tyson could beat 110% of Buster Douglas. Were you overconfident? Well, I'm not going to say that. I mean, I won't make a statement like that. Buster, did you have a game plan? You said immediately after the fight I was fighting him on instinct. Surely you must have had some game plan. Well, to get off first. That was the whole point. Use my speed and lateral movement. Other fighters their instincts for self-preservation kicks in almost immediately as the fight starts and they begin to sense Mike's speed and power. But you didn't seem to be rattled by that. That, it seemed to me, was the key to your 
winning, that you stayed in there with him. Well, yes, I'm a man and he is a man also. And, and I accepted his challenge. When I signed that contract to fight for the heavyweight championship, I signed the fight for the heavyweight championship. And it was an opportunity of a lifetime for me and I made the best of it. I prepared well for the fight and everything just went, as, went, went according to plan. You keep hinting here, Mike, that this was not the Mike Tyson. Were you in the best shape you could be in? I've read now that you may have been 10 to 20 pounds uh, over your fighting weight uh, a few weeks before the fight, that maybe you weren't as disciplined in your food and drink as you normally would be before a fight. Were you as focused as you should have been? You know, I can't, you know, I can't comment. Bust you know what I mean? Saying anything like that is just, you know what I mean? Just distorting away from the champion, and that's this far. You know, what I mean, he's the champion of the world, and I fought a fight. You know, what I mean, I didn't fight my best fight. He fought a splendid fight. You know, what I mean, I'm looking forward to getting it together again. You know what I mean, looking backward, was the fact that Greg Page knocked you down in in training, which has happened to you before and happens mm -hmm. to a lot of fighters, did that indicate some laxness, some lack of focus on your part? See, you must understand the fact that was just blowing out of proportion about me getting knocked down. Mm -hmm. I never got knocked down in training. You know what I mean? I've trained and I didn't have great sessions and everything. But, you know, that's normal when training. Things like that happen. So, like I said, you know what I mean, two guys fought that night and he had a better night. Buster, usually Mike establishes his dominance very early in the fight. Could you see anything different? In, in the first round, second, third rounds, that he knew suddenly that it, he wasn't going to be dominant? Could you see, sense anything or see anything in his eyes? No, because he continued to come in. He continued to, you know, make his attack. He never stopped fighting. Uh, it was nothing that I seen that where, you know, I felt that I was in control. You know, I felt if anything, in the eighth round, I started admiring my work, admiring the fact that I was in there, you know, doing so well and got caught with a shot. I had a little, a lax, a lax, a relaxed moment. And I think it cost me for that, on that knockdown. But uh, other than that, no, I never sensed uh, seeing how Mike was, you know, had started faltering because he was strong throughout the fight. He took good shots and he, and he kept fighting. He never once, you know, seemed to be where he was giving up. Now we want to show you some startling footage Footage that shows that history repeats itself and that the 10 count isn't what any of us thought it was and until now had no reason to question. September 22, 1927, Soldier Field, Chicago. The rematch of the champion Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey, a part of the mythology of boxing. Because Dempsey had hovered over decked opponents throughout his career, a new rule was in force. When a fighter was knocked down, the count would begin only when the other fighter goes to a neutral corner. Dempsey dropped Tunney in the seventh round, but forgot the new rule. So the referee properly picked up the count late. Tunney barely got up at nine. Looking closely at the controversy, Dempsey surely put Tunney down with a vicious combination. By failing to go to the neutral corner, the clock shows that the referee's count begins at five seconds. The crucial sidelight to this controversy is that at the count of four, Tunney is clearly looking at the referee, ready to continue. Nine seconds of real time had elapsed on the clock. The clear-headed Tunney could have gotten up and gone on. He went on to win the decision. But for a long time, people believed that but for Dempsey's goof, he would have recaptured the title. Uh, what about that uh, Gene Tunney long count without the end? Well, I hope so, because that was one of the greatest breaks I ever got. And the reason I say that, a lot of my friends who saw the fight still think I won it. As long as I can make them still think that, I say I'm a pretty lucky guy because Gene's a pretty small fellow. Under the scrutiny of today's technology and media, the myth would have been dispelled much earlier. 63 years after that celebrated incident, Tunney's stare at the referee 
is duplicated by Buster Douglas. The rule. When a contestant is knocked down, the referee shall audibly announce the count as he motions with his right arm downward, indicating the end of each second of the count. If the contestant taking the count is still down when the referee calls the count of 10, the referee will wave both arms, indicating that the contestant has been knocked out. The letter of the rule presents a paradox between the count of the referee and the count of some imaginary timepiece that neither he nor the timekeeper uses in the heat of battle. The 14-second knockout is commonplace. Octavio Mehron was doing in Tokyo just what comes naturally to all referees. All right, we've examined the fight from every angle but a canvas cam, a camera from underneath the ring, and the corner cams. Douglas naturally had a happy corner. Tyson, curiously, a rather calm corner. Mike, did you know you were in trouble in this fight? Was your corner alerting you to the fact that you were falling behind and that you needed to do something fierce and dramatic? Well, you know, I never think about that. I never have that in my mind. I mean, thinking about being behind, you know, it was a tough fight and you had to come back and fight hard. Don't you think it's a corner's job to say, listen, Mike, you're, you are behind and you got to step it up? Yeah, they, 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 exp they express that. You know what I mean? I know it's, it's a matter of time I'll catch the guy. I mean, I was trying, I was doing my best to come on, but as you say, we were clashing heads, and I was trying to face him on the side, because it was very difficult for me to see him from my left side. Your corner only had a problem after the eighth round. What was the sense of it there? How did they deal with it? After the knockdown? Yes. Well, they, they uh, you know, rest me down and questioned me to see if my faculties was in order. And after they found out that I was all right, then they went on and instructed me to, to further, to continue fighting, you know, they instructed me in a way to continue to fight. Well, I mean, did they say, look, he's going to come out after you, you've got to buy time? No, never. He came out after me every round, uh, you know, so it was, we knew where he was coming. So you were going to find out real quick How? whether you could deal with him after the knockdown. Right, right. Mike, you've repeatedly stated you couldn't see out of that left eye. How much did it contribute, do you think, to the beating you finally took in the ninth and tenth rounds? Well, you know, I mean, regardless of my difference, I, you know, I mean, one of them was close. I had another one. That's all that mattered to me. You know, I mean, taking the punches wasn't nothing. I mean, but you couldn't see out of that eye, well, and he, you, and he was hitting you with right, with right hands. Well, my heart was beating. That's all that mattered. So I just kept fighting. Are you angry at all at the men in your corner for not treating the eye? In the, in the right way, in the accepted way. They didn't have an end swell to try to move it. They didn't have an ice bag. You, know I mean, you can't blame, you know what I mean? I'm not trying, you can't, no one, anyone tried it, because you must have been thinking of reading those papers, people saying you had a, um, a, a corner that was, you know what I mean, pretty much, uh, mature, immature, you know, that's ridiculous. We went out there, you know what I mean? We lost to the guy that fought the best that night. But you know, there was no reason, regardless of what, if you got, you got your eyes closed, you got one eye, you have another one, I mean, use that one. You fight to the finish, man. You can't make no excuses. Perception out there is that you have surrounded yourself with some affable fellows who, who you like and who like you and make you feel good, but that they don't have the authority to drive Mike Tyson to the furthest point in training mm. to really move him. Is that, a, is that an accurate picture? No, and that's, you know, I mean, that's a ridiculous insult on behalf of my intelligence because the people that, um, that I have involved in me, the people that I trust, and people are basically my childhood friends, John Horn and Rory Holloway, you know, I mean, I mean you can't blame them. You can't look for somebody to blame or something, you know, because they're young and they're inexperienced. They're on the job training. No, what, what, what the charge is is that you're at fault for not bringing more 
professional guys that could push you. What, bring somebody that comes in like a week before the fight and train me or something? That's ridiculous. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, the people that I'm with, I'm very comfortable with. It's just that I, out of 37 fights, I had 37 good nights, and at the 38th, I had one bad night. You know what I mean, there's no means, of, you know, no doubt in my mind, regardless of his decision, he's running around, you know what I mean, running off with his mouth saying he's going to fight, make me wait, or his manager make me wait, he'll fight. Regardless of who he fights, you know, I'm going to get my title back, regardless. If he fight Holyfield, and hopefully I'm going to get it back from Holyfield, regardless. Buster, we've talked about uh, Mike's conditioning, yet you were sick for a week and a half before the fight, and and you're never famous for being in top top condition. How did that affect you? Well, it had no effect, I guess. Uh, I went out there and fought the best fight I could. You know, like I said, I signed the fight for the weight championship. It's a dream. Weren't you from. taking penicillin and other drugs? I was taking Just penicillin and antihistamine and some. Uh, to me, I just mouth washed the gargle from my throat because I had inflamed, uh, tongue. my throat was swollen also. So I was a bit under the weather also. But the fight pumped you up so much that it didn't affect you at all? Well, I fought to the best of my capabilities. I got, I got out of what, what, what I had. When all the punches are fired, sometimes the real firing is just starting. A lot of questions were answered and answers questioned after Tyson Douglas, or to put it in its post-fight frame of reference, Douglas Tyson. Other questions to consider. Should a fighter who has been so thoroughly beaten, as Tyson was, take an immediate rematch? Is anyone considering that? And what of promoter Don King? Ringside observers were so mesmerized by the action in the ring that they didn't notice King immediately and desperately making a protest to Jose Suleiman of the WBC after the eighth round knockdown. He still wasn't sure that Tyson could pull the fight out, so he would try to save his title outside the ring. His motives were revealed in a choreographed post-fight press conference. Everybody has seen the facts, and the facts are irrefutable and incontrovertible. A public outcry erupted. King and Tyson were seen as alibying losers. The commissions reacted by finally recognizing Buster Douglas as the undisputed champion, but only after two of the three, the WBA and the WBC, killed some of the joy of the upset by at first withholding the claim. Finally, when they arrived in New York, Tyson and King conceded the title. There's never been a question from my side as to who the heavyweight champion of the world was. And I respect the fact that the new, the new champion won the title. But the only thing I'm saying, I wouldn't try and I wouldn't want the title on a change decision, you know what I mean? You win the title in the ring, you lose it in the ring, I believe. I'm just saying that Mike's not going on the deep end, he's not discouraged. The only thing I ask for is just a rematch, that's all. Simple as that. Once I get a rematch, I'll take care of everything from there. That's all I'm asking for as a champion. And what about the brouhaha surrounding the Tyson cornermen past and present? Ex-trainer Kevin Rooney, fired by Tyson, ripped his unsuccessful successors. But Tyson gave a loyal vote of confidence to co-trainers Aaron Snow and Jay Bright. An issue of their competence is why they used a bloated ice bag for the swollen eye. Today, the end swell is the accepted piece of hardware to lessen the puffiness which causes the eye to close. But don't expect changes in Tyson's corner. When the fight was over, I noted that if you have a secretariat, you don't put any jockey on him, you get the best. Because even great athletes occasionally need help to get out of trouble, which Tyson definitely was in. Here with us to discuss that trouble and his corner and other aspects of the fight are Gil Clancy, the boxing commentator for CBS in Madison Square Garden, a former trainer and manager and promoter, and Angelo Dundee, who also has spent a thousand and one nights in corners. Gentlemen, you were watching the fight, you saw the corner work. Did it keep Mike Tyson from having a chance to retain his title? 
Well, the biggest fault that I found with the corner, uh, technically, is the fact that they didn't have an end swell. If you don't have an end swell to, to, to control that swelling, you're going to have problems. Then they tried to do it with an ice bag. And what they forgot to do, when you have an ice bag, you pack it tight with ice. But when it's there, air gets in it and water, the ice melts. So what you have to do between each round, you have to unscrew the top and take the water out so that you have a real tight fit when you put that ice up against that swelling and try to work it out. You know, end swell is not that uh, new a thing. Before end swell, we used to use a silver dollar. And I was always more effective in a corner because I'd always have that silver dollar. This guy couldn't go for more than a half a buck. <laughs> <laughs> you were setting us up there, Gil. Angelo, ninth and tenth rounds, Tyson caught a lot of punches because his eye was closed. Yet he still had enough power to have knocked him down in the eighth. Did he still have a chance to win that if his eye wasn't as bad? I don't think the eye was that big a deal, really. I don't mm -hmm. think it actually closed. Mm -hmm. uh, the only th the comment I got to make about the eye, that it was just whatever he had, he, that abortion he had in the corner, he just held it against the eye. Well, you don't get a swelling out of an eye if you don't move it away from the eye. That was not enough. We used ice bags much longer than before we used end swell. Do you think that he was alerted clearly enough to the trouble he was in and motivated to go out there and do anything about it. Well, you know, uh, Angelo in the fight with, with when Sugar Ray Leonard fought Tommy Hearns the first time, I have to give Angelo all the credit in the world because he, he told Ray Leonard, you're blowing the fight, son. Nowadays, these guys are afraid to talk to the fighters. They're afraid to make the fighter angry at them. They forget what their job is. They're his friend, his uncle, or his confidant, whatever but they're not guys that are motivated. Sometimes you have to use different psychology, but you have to do something to wake a guy up. Haven't you slapped a champion of the world around in the corner? Well, you know, it's a funny thing. Sometimes you look at a fighter and he's looking at you and he looks like he's hypnotized. He's not paying a bit of attention. He's going like this with his head, but really he's not paying attention and you have to get his attention. And on, with Emil Griffith, when he won the welterweight championship, I saw he was that way and I gave him a little slap and it woke him up. and. Next round, by luck or whatever, he went out and he scored a knockout. But you have to do different things to motivate fighters. You just can't let it go round after round at the same pace if you're losing. Angelo, outside of Douglas's relatives and close friends, you're the only one I know on the planet who gave him a real chance to win this fight. Why? Had the credentials, had the right guy behind him. Not too many people knew John Johnson. I co-managed a fighter with John Johnson. I know what type of individual he is. He had the motivation. He's a go guy, John Johnson. And I knew Douglas, strong, tough, 6'4", good left hand, mobility. He got motivated by A. John Johnson. He has different folks for different strokes. You were talking about the corner job. Snow was a competent guy, but you know what was wrong? He worships at Tyson Shrine. I don't worship my fighters. I'm there to give them, try to ad-lib something. I never know what the heck I'm going to do. In fact, you know, and sometimes I've used some stuff, you know, that they beat me out a little bit, but you do whatever you got to do to get your fighter up. And the one time when I saw Tyson in the corner and his head was down, I blew my stack. Could I have told him, get your stinking head up, you're a world champion. Because that would have blew my stack. Was Mike Tyson in shape in your judgment? Can you see? Well, you know, uh, I think Mike Tyson, his weight was down. He was 220 pounds. But uh, you can train for two months or three months. But it's what you've been doing for the last year or so. And I think a lot of Tyson's uh, loose living caught up with him on that night. Let's go to a rematch. Forget the money. The man has just taken a beating. You're his trainer. Do you want him to get back in the ring with the same guy who just gave him a beating four months or six months later well I, you know mike tyson has a lot of pride and you know he did show a lot of courage in that fight because even when he had no legs he was still throwing a dangerous punches but i don't see what the hurry is uh, myself unless he figures he's never going to get another uh, shot at the championship of the world uh, and again mike tyson is going to be fighting under a disadvantage now that he, he always had a tremendous tremendous advantage with intimidation he was the greatest fighter on the world nobody could beat him Iron Mike Tyson, and I've always said he's not iron, he's made out of flesh and blood. All that stuff came to pass. When he goes in the ring next time, it's going to be more even because the other guy's not going to have that much respect for him. What happens in a rematch, Angelo? I think Douglas wins unless it's a complete turnabout in every which way of Tyson. 
What do you think? I, I would have to say that uh, unless my unless and it's, even as they say in this fight, even at the very end of the fight, Mike Tyson was throwing punches with bad intentions. You have to give him credit for that. Had a lot of heart. But unless he lands the big one and gets Buster out of there, I think Douglas will beat him again. Thank you very much, Gil Clancy and Angelo Dundee. If a Chicago alderman outwitted Gorbachev or Lafayette High School crushed the 49ers, Buster Douglas' victory would still top them all. So what does the future now hold for the heavyweight division? Douglas is in a position to dictate. He has already dictated that there won't be a quick rematch. And what about top contender Evander Holyfield? It'll take a check with a lot of zeros on it to get him to step aside. My goal is to be the heavyweight champ, like I said. And, you know, I looked at Douglas. Douglas is a very smart fight, smart fighter, and I have to prepare myself to fight Douglas. That's the man that I have to fight. Until Don comes to me and says to me, Shell, I'd like to do something because I have a match or I have a tentative match or I'm planning to make a match, I'm sticking with the position that we're the next um, challenger. If he comes to me and says to me at that point, I can make a deal with Buster Douglas and I can do blah, blah, blah. If blah, blah, blah makes sense, Dan and Ken Sanders and I will talk about it. If not, we're going to look to fight the Buster Douglas. So what and when will it be? So Mike Tyson wants an immediate rematch. But should he? Now that he's been exposed as a mere vulnerable human, will he be as domineering in the future? And can Buster Douglas sustain a level of excellence that is new for him. Mike, I sense a, a kind of agitation on your part that Buster Douglas and his manager are now talking about not wanting to fight in June, maybe wanting to fight in September, maybe fighting Holyfield first. Uh, what's that make you feel? Well, you know, I mean, um, I'm just saying basically as a fighter, when I, when I was champion, I, you know, I didn't discriminate. I fought anyone you put in front of me. And I gave him an opportunity when he really didn't, um, wasn't a mandatory contender. But, you know, I mean, if, I think it would only be rightful for him to do the same. But then again, I mean, if he figures he doesn't want to and he wants to fight Holofield, you know, regardless, you know, I mean, let him do what he feels better. And what do you feel, Buster? It's not up to me, actually. You know, it's what the best offer. Um, that's up to Don King and John Johnson. So whoever they come up with, then I'll fight. Uh, I was only speaking to Holyfield after the title fight was because he was supposed to fight the winner. He's the number one contender. The number one contender. So if it was, he wants to step back and let Mike fight me, then I, it doesn't matter. I'll fight whoever. Are you concerned that if you were to go into the ring with Mike again and lose, that people would say you were a fluke? No. It, 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 you can't consider that fight a fluke because it went 10 rounds. I got up off the canvas. I was winning the fight. And then I, and then I won the fight. I mean, it's different if it was like a one-shot, one-punch, a one-punch knockout, you know, a punch coming out of the blue and, and landing, but I was dominating the fight. Mike, again, as a student of history, you know that uh, Joe Lewis didn't fight Max Schmeling again for two years after he took a beating. Uh, Muhammad Ali didn't fight Joe Frazier again for three years. What is the rush? The fight won't go away, will it? It won't go away, but, you know, I just want to... I just want to get in there. Yeah. Even though he's just holding in on me, a temporary residence, that's all. Is it hard to be without the title? Hey, I mean, when you really think about it, you know, I've been successful, you know what I mean, and it's been very rewarding, but you know, this is the business. I, I like the title. More so, you know, the money is great and the rewards of what the title brought is great. But, you know, I, you know what I mean, I, I want to, I want to, Give my performance. Out of the whole fight, the only thing I was disappointed in, I wasn't disappointed in losing, you know what I mean? Because that's part of, this is the fight business. I understand the business. The only thing I was disappointed in was just my performance. And you know what I mean? The fight was supposed to for a great fight. I was just only dis disappointed in my performance. Do you feel it's in your best interest? You've seen fighters uh, after a, a, uh, a tough, really hard fight that it might not be a good idea to come right back, that it might be a, an idea to sit back and, and wait. Please, spare me. <laughs> spare you what? <laughs> yeah, I, I doubt that happening. <laughs> well, that's the way a fighter should think about it. Uh, Buster, what have been your moves? I noticed that when you came to New York, you were originally supposed to stay in Donald Trump's hotel. 
but your manager didn't want you to stay there because he didn't want to create the impression that you were beholden to Trump for a future promotion. Um, at the time, you were still not uh, really all together with King. How independent are you going to be, can you be, in the situation you're in, in which Don King has options on your services? Well, I can't really elaborate on that because that's not my end of the, um, the boxing. All I think I do is fight. I fight whoever they put in front of me. You know, that's, that's John Johnson. He's the one that's running. He, can, he controls all the business aspect of it. Then he confers them with me. Mike, you've seen fighters after they lose their first fight and they're feeling that they're inv invulnerable, they start to get a little tentative and they go downhill. How would you guard against that? Well, like you said before, you know, I'm a student of the game, please. I mean, these things happen. It's just temporary minor setback for a few seconds, a month or two months, whatever the situation is. You know I mean, like you say, I'm in good enough spirits to fight today. I mean, I feel great. You know what I mean? And about people reading and saying, I mean, by no means me and Don King, by, you know, I'm just getting off the subject for a minute, are collaborating to do anything uh, diabolical to take any titles. You know what I mean, all that, you know, bull shenanigans, you know what I mean? We just was here, we had a team once, it's my vital team, Tyson, you know what I mean? And his business is to look after my situation at that particular moment. But for all means, nobody tried to get a fast one. You see, he got the title, you know what I mean? And for as long as he has it, regardless, you know, I mean, he's happy until the time comes we fight again. Buster, can you sustain a level of excellence that you have never achieved before? Yes. Yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Does it give you a new sense of who you are as an athlete? Yeah, well, yes, it does. I've, uh, I know I can do it. It's not something that I was shocked. I was fighting over my head. I was fighting within James Douglas. I was just the best came out of James Douglas. I was up for the fight, and I'll always be up for the fights. Now being heavyweight champion of the world, undisputed. Mike, you were perceived before this fight as invincible, Frankenstein, a monster. Now you're looked upon as human, someone who bleeds, who falls when he's hit often enough. Is that a plus for you in some way? You know what I mean? From what I never look, I never believe my in my news clippings. I mean, you guys read. You know, I basically knows who I am, and my basic main concern is that he fought a good night. But I know I'm the best fighter in the world still to this day. And if he feels he is, he's going to have to prove it again, unless he wants to run off and fight Evander. <laughs> Lester, you're a hero now. Can you handle being a hero? How has it been? It's been great. I came home uh, to a uh, my my house was just. Uh, decorated the neighbors that decorated my home with balloons uh signs camp country uh it was great i really enjoyed it thank you buster thank you mike for both coming in here to tell us more about that remarkable night in tokyo last week do you get the feeling they're still not best friends but money doesn't just talk in prize fighting it shouts it screams so it's almost certain there'll be a rematch this year if I managed Buster Douglas, I'd say to him, whoopee, we're going to make so much money, our grandchildren will be able to retire on it. But let's not rush into anything. Don't let the money men stampede us. Now you're a hero. Let's kick back for six months and enjoy it. And this is exactly what his manager, John Johnson, is saying to him. If I were managing Mike Tyson, however, I'd take a different tack. I'd say to him, Mike, you just took a beating. I think you'll beat him up next time. But if you get another punishing fight, or if you happen to lose again, it could be fatal for your career. You're still only 23. Let's not rush into this. Relax for a few months. Go back to the gym, take a couple of fights, and then we'll get the title back. Be that as it probably won't be, Two athletes in the purest form of competition gave us a jolt of inspiring theater. A seemingly indestructible force, probably overconfident, was brought to his knees by an underdog galvanized by opportunity and personal tragedy to fight the fight of his life. Which reminded us with savage eloquence that if there's a skinny man trying to get out of every fat man, there's also a hero trying to get out of every ordinary man. For Jim Lampley, Sugar Ray Leonard, and the HBO staff, I'm Larry Merchant.
beat the count. He got a little overconfident. Got a little loosey-goosey. Still wobbly. Let's see what Mike can do to finish. And the bell ends to save Buster Douglas at the end of round eight. It's over. It's over. Mike Tyson has been knocked out. Unbelievable. Say it now, gentlemen. James Buster Douglas, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Be sure to join us for our next telecast of World Championship Boxing, a unification fight between two champions. Julio Cesar Chavez takes on Meldrick Taylor live Saturday, March 17th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on HBO. The executive producer of HBO Sports and the producer of Tyson vs. Douglas is Ross Greenberg. Tonight's telecast was directed by Mark Payton. The replay producers were Rick Bernstein and Michael J. Whalen. The feature producer was Dave Harmon. The associate producer was Brian McDonald. The assistants of the producers were Kendall Reed and Kirby Bradley. The production manager was Russ Gabay, and the technical supervisor, George Wenzel. presentation of HBO Sports, the network of champions. The experts are calling it the fight of the year. Undefeated Julio Cesar Chavez takes on undefeated Meldrick Taylor. Chavez, considered by many the pound-for-pound -pound best fighter in the world. Meldrick Taylor, Olympic gold medalist, lightning speed, thunderous left hook. HBO Sports presents the WBC IBF 140-pound title unification bout. Julio Cesar Chavez takes on Meldrick Taylor. Saturday, March 17th, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific on HBO. We're talking serious comedy here as HBO showcases the unique talents of Larry Miller on One Night Stand. 